summer school is the first part of a, a two part event. So we uh, uh, were taking advantage of the kind of hospitality of Omar. Uh, welcome to campus for the first part, which will take place this week. Yeah. Um, and the second part will be a workshop in uh, EMAS, which is a research institute uh, uh, within the UNAM infrastructure and um, The event is entitled Threshold Phenomena in Spectral Analysis and Their Applications to Waves and Tectonics. So basically, uh, we would like to kind of uh, uh, get together uh, people who have been working on recent years on uh, uh, spectral analysis uh, of uh, problems, problems, especially in relation to wave propagation uh, through heterogeneous media and media with uh, uh, resonances and more generally uh, um, the kind of things that uh, uh, people refer to as resonant phenomena uh, or threshold phenomena in spectral analysis and operating things. So I hope that all these words, which may sound to some of you um, a bit strange, that will get clarified in the course of this week, actually. So the point of the summer school is to try and give a gentle introduction to these topics, so that, let's say, it was the end of this week, the uh, title of uh, this summer school makes a bit more sense. Um, so this event is part of a uh, series of workshops that have been running since um, 2015. Uh, they uh, are organized by uh, the University of Bath, the UNA, um, and uh, the CIMAT, right? So we have had events in Guanajuato and also in Merida, in CIMAT Merida, and we have had several events in Mexico City, in UNA, um, uh, and uh, several events in, uh, in Bath. And uh, there are kind of two hubs uh, of activities. One is around probability and statistics, and the other one is around uh, analysis, mathematical analysis of uh, uh, problems in wave propagation and continuum mechanics. And uh, so that this event is part of the second half. Uh, but you're welcome to check the uh, web page of uh, our network and see about what other workshops are up and running. There is one on statistics and probability um, taking place in Simat uh, Guanajuato in January 2023. So they are currently in the process of uh, preparing this event and the web page. Okay, so uh, um, a bit more about the event this week. So we have um, four mini courses each uh, running over three hours. So over uh, a reasonably wide range of topics in relation to the title of the summer school. Um, so basically from uh, analysis of the radius and spectral theory to continue Mechanics. And also, these are complemented by several uh, one hour talks. We have two today and uh, three more over the coming days, so five talks in total. So, these, we, these are more sort of uh, focused on uh, what's going on in the uh, related research areas right now. Where is the the mini courses are those gentle introductions that I mentioned earlier. Okay, and uh, without further ado, I will introduce our first speaker today, um, uh, Leonardo Abbaf, who is, uh, who is a member of staff here at uh, UMAR. Um, and uh, oh, I need to remind myself of the title of your talk. Um, so, uh, the second talk will be by Andre, Andrew Komich from um, Texas A&M University. 
Um, so Leonardo's talk will be on capacitive networks. Okay, so please, the floor is yours. The same way is totally different. I'm going to talk about the past networks with new approach. These new approach are some methods of algebraic theory and that topology. For studying circuits, particularly for studying capacity networks. Here, let's define C1, this circuit of branch. Each branch is a vector. Alpha, theta, gamma, and beta of vectors forms a base of C1. Okay. Each, each branch each are vectors. Okay. Here, for example, Right, I am you hear me? Here, uh, we can write the foundation of these vectors. Q is a vector of each, each charge, each capacitor. Here, a vector C0 of nodes. Here, each node is to a vector. So A, B, C, D forms a vector, a vector. We insert A, B, C, D forms a base of zero. Dimension C1 number of branches. Dimension C0 number of nodes. Vector space C1 is called the space of one change. Vector space C0 is called the space of zero change. This nomenclature comes from algebraic topology. Here uh, we can find the power map. Then C one to C zero 
Boundary map. Zero. 
is this concentration of charge. Or conservation of charge. I is a cycle. You should hold a law with this condition that is a zero chain C. C zero is a form of the function such that the P equal minus D T, where D represents the voltage in all the ways of the circuit. This is voltage, it's equal voltage in range R alpha is equal to range P alpha. P is a general then equal to a voltage per alpha. Per alpha job already defined. It's minus P minus A equal. Rotation function are nine. Here the rotation and the cost of Alpha because because double is a button okay. necessarily I want to know of energy in this pattern. Next to like negative, 
possible. This coordinates branch is Let's use this convention. Let Q belongs to one with a vector representing the charge of the capacitors. Let O belongs to zero with a charge of the noise. Then L Q equal minus four. The equation one is now tau squared. This tau squared that this should not be known. This is one of the importance of studying this type of system for with only capacitors because we relation this great question of electric time. This which version of the other stuff is, is very interesting. But here is what we first first from this which form the other stuff. Very, very important, right? But that was Charge here and the other flow. So here, what do not rationalize? No, the dust wall here is so fresh. It's boundary. This is equal to this charge. Here is similar to this is charge. Here is the boundary. It's good. For some question, as well, this expression of this equation, some here that I faster this equation, no very well equation. Here is quick uh, And now we will assume that the capacity of this. Do not have voltage source. This is probably the input zero model. But from manipulating the equation, first equation, addition to the capacity, you will be equal to zero. Second equation, Kishoff, convention law. Third equation, Gauss law. Third equation, you find this. Equation two, draw or this person, which we created by the CP store of the person, is the electrolyte symbol. With this, we have this person. In the equation two, can be Right. 
charge G a kind of environment is for a response. Genius version here in the first you find this With a partial equation, but here perspective. Question here. So divide the power in nodes. We should divide the nodes into two types: bundle nodes and zero nodes. Here, bundle nodes are connected to external socket. This external socket Potential in a statistical value. Zero nodes do not connect to any standard source, but only with the other nodes of the circuit. With this, we have the following proposition. This divides some. Here, AB are two modern nodes. I, this I, I connect to the standard source. Okay. But C and D, no, 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 I connect with standard source. Which led from version, discrete version, right? Very known as well. But here is a discrete version. They provide the chance of zero nodes at all zero, all needs equal zero. Potential about the boundary nodes is provided. For general version, this uh, charts are zero to the nuance know the potential. Here, the same. So you find the potential of the general nodes to meet the charge of the boundary nodes. Well, here we use the equation. The equation here is uh, multiplication, methods multiplication, because this is the actual nature. Then I make this here to follow the this here. Equal to zero. Okay. Because uh, here we manage to find T eat. Because 
System, we can get find the feet, 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 then we, we it's necessary to equations so get this terms in here I find equations in the system okay. I define the law in this here because now we know change to operate to now we know the bound is provided we get the bound is this solve which will help for some equation problem here, the name was charge. We cannot charge provided the potential boundary provided to equal zero. The potentials of the boundary nodes are all numbers. The bound equal zero. The charge of the we need to find the potentials of the nodes in the charge of the boundary nodes. Then find P in this equation. Here we know the charge. You know, charts, you know, is provided. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is set up a uh, linear system to mm -hmm. mm -hmm. get feed. With feed, we get feed So, the concentration of This is, this is very important too because we it's possible to reach to conclusion or get some intuition intuition for continuous problems too. It's true. Right? It's true. It already happened. It's true. Starting with this discrete problem, we match uh, for problem in continuum. In fact, here we have the position of C1. Here, uh, the sign uh, in the product. Which is in the product? We manage this orthogonal block sum. But we 
Function because uh, it's time, lecture, sure, sure. but these, these methods use this proposition in your theorems. To demonstrate your theorems, use this proposition, use your thesis. Some, some Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so whether they form a bound state or whether they form a virtual state. So this is how this name virtual came into effect. Right, uh, and then uh, so according to uh, the subsequent research, it turned out that actually this is not a bound state. This is a virtual state, right, with this negative binding energy. So when the spins are anti-parallel, proton and neutron cannot form a bound state. Uh, an illustration which uh, seems convenient is um, the following: if you have two people right uh, each has two rubles right and as you uh, as some people know the price of a bottle of vodka in russia was four rubles and 12 copics so imagine two people who meet in a park each has two rubles right they try to form a bound state right to buy a bottle of vodka and they're a little bit short of money so they will not just scatter right away right they will spend a little a time together trying, you know, checking their pockets, maybe looking underneath, trying to find remaining change, uh, then eventually they cannot, right? So eventually they will part, uh, but you will sort of, uh, like on the experiment, it will be some somehow wider cross section of scattering, right? So you see that particles somehow try to form a bound state. Uh, so, Anyways, this is where the name virtual uh, comes from. Although, you know, in mathematics, of course, a virtual level will be when the, this energy, this bound state is sort of exactly of zero energy. So we will be dealing with the states which are exactly at the threshold. So let's go to the next page here, please. Yes, so uh, another... Uh, contribution to this uh, comes from uh, radiation principle, right? Uh, you, you will see in a second uh, how these things merge. Uh, so you start uh, with the Helmgold's equation, which is negative Laplace minus Z acting on U equals F, and you want to find the solution U. And if Z is, uh, has non-zero imaginary part, or if Z is strictly negative, uh, then there will be, uh, if F is from L2, then there will be a unique L2 solution, right? Which is given by this convolution, right? So E to negative X root of negative Z divided by four pi X convolution with F. Uh, 
right? Uh, we could say that if Z is not from the spectrum of negative Laplace, right, then minus Z minus Laplace minus Z uh, is invertible, right? There is a bounded inverse which acts on U, uh, which acts on F and gives you this function U. Right, but if z is on the essential spectrum, if z equals a k square and k is non-negative, then there could be no L2 solution, uh, or uh, and in this case the solution is not unique. So the radiation principle is a way to specify a particular solution in this case. Uh, the first approach to this uh, problem comes from an article by Ignatovsky, which was published in 1905. Right, and the idea was that you see, you want to act by this negative, by the resolvent of negative Laplace, you want to act on the function f. So what you will do is you will add some imaginary part to k. So instead of k square, you will write k plus i epsilon square. And then you will consider, uh, you will consider the limit as epsilon approaches zero. Right? If you do math uh, algebra correctly, you will see that u in this case will be approximately a limit of this e to plus i, a k plus i epsilon. You see i times i is negative, right? So in case of when epsilon is positive, this will be some nice uh, decaying exponent, right? And then epsilon tends to zero, you end up with e to i k r, epsilon value of x. And this is of course very similar uh, to Sommerfeld radiation condition. Right, so you require that this limit of r times d over dr minus i k u, right, when r goes to infinity equals zero, right, which also produces uh, u of the form e to i k r as opposed to e to negative i k r, right. So in both cases, you end up with the same uh, solution to the Helmholtz equation. Uh, well, let me point out that actually Ignatovsky's uh, article appeared like seven years earlier. And in fact, uh, this principle seems uh, more convenient in many applications. It does not depend on the structure of the space, while Zomerfeld's article deals with specifically with R3, with this Euclidean space. So let's go to the next page, please. So this is just a little bit about Ignatovsky. Uh, unfortunately, his name is not well known, although uh, he was a very uh, prominent uh, scientist, uh, both physicist and mathematician. He has many, contribution, uh, many contributions in uh, general theory of relativity, uh, in uh, also many works. In particular, he was dealing with the electrification uh, of, uh, what is it, of trams uh, in St. Petersburg in 1904, 1903, right? Uh, so then uh, he was leading the theoretical division of uh, this LOMO, which is, uh, it's a very well-known uh, Russian optical factory dealing with uh, uh, optics for, well, military applications, etc. Uh, unfortunately, uh, he ended up, uh, he, uh, he, he died tragically in, uh, during the blockade in St. Petersburg, right? So he was killed by KGB and, well, not KGB and, and KVD in January 1942, accused of uh, spying for Germany, which was, uh, of course, completely not true. But so anyways, uh, eventually his name just disappeared from all the textbooks where this limiting absorption principle was considered. Uh, and as a result, his name is not that well known in mathematics as it should be. So let's go to the next page, please. So then this further development of this limiting absorption principle uh, I, I, so I need to mention many, many names here. So here is this very brief list of, you know, Weil, Carloman, Tichmarsh, uh, Krein. Uh, the approach which is closer to what we will be talking about is due to Biermann, right? So he was considering semi-bounded self-adjoint operators. So for example, if you are dealing with the Schrodinger operator, you can consider the closure of L2 with respect to uh, this quadratic form, right? Gradient phi square plus v phi square, 
right? And this eventually leads to a theory which is more or less consistent with virtual levels in the sense that we will use, although uh, in this case, it will be only semi-bounded, so bounded from below self-adjoint operators. So what we will need is more general theory. Also related topic, uh, this is all also related to subcritical and critical Schrodinger operators from articles by Simon, Murata, etc. So let's go to the next page, please. Right. So a recent meaning of a limiting absorption principle is essentially due to Shmuel Agman. Right. There were several preceding articles by Reito uh, in particular. So uh, the idea is the following. You see, as you know, the resolvent of the operator does not have a limit when the spectral parameter Z approaches the spectrum, right? The norm of the resolvent goes to infinity. So in the limit, uh, there is nothing. But you can consider the resolvent as acting not from X to X, right? You can consider it as acting in different spaces. So the main result by Agman was uh, that if you consider the resolvent as acting in this L2S spaces, right? So L2S spaces, you see this red definition at the bottom of the page, right? So it's uh, L2 norm, but with the algebraic weight. So the larger S, the smaller the space is, right? Uh, so it turns out that this uh, resolvent of the Laplace operator remains uniformly bounded as an operator from L to S to L to negative S. If you take S sufficiently large, you need S larger than one half, right? And then the resolvent will remain uniformly bounded as long as Z approaches the essential spectrum, uh, but uh, not the threshold. You need to approach some uh, point Z zero, which is positive. Uh, that is, uh, we can say that uh, there is, we approach the bulk of the essential spectrum, but not the threshold. At the threshold, uh, the, the norm will go to, uh, the norm of the resolvent will go to the infinity. So again, th so the first important uh, piece of knowledge is that, so this is essentially Agamemnon's presentation at this Congress of Mathematicians in 1970, uh, is that, I think it was in Japan, uh, is that uh, the resolvent of the Laplace operator remains uniformly bounded as long as Z stays away from the origin, but approaches the bulk of this, uh, could approach the bulk of the essential spectrum. So this is true for any dimension. So you see D is any positive, uh, any uh, natural number. So let's go to the next page, please. So now what about the threshold? What if is the spectral parameter approaches the zero, which is zero, right? Uh, in three dimensions, the resolvent has this explicit form. It is given by the integral kernel uh, as you see here, right? So e to negative x minus y root of negative z divided by four pi x minus y. So you see, this is the expression which has nice limit as z approaches zero, the threshold, right? So in three dimensions, this seems nice. Uh, in one dimension, this is not nice. You can still write the integral kernel of the resolvent. So now it will be this e to negative something divided by two root of negative z. And as you see, as z approaches zero, uh, this quantity does not have a nice limit, right? Well, unless you act, for example, uh, on odd functions, right? Then this singularity would cancel. Well, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but at the moment you see uh, the behavior of the resolvent at zero depends on the dimension. In dimension three, and also in fact, in any higher dimension, the resolvent has some limit. Uh, in dimension one and also in dimension two, there is no limit. So let's go to the next page, please. So virtual levels, this behavior of the resolvent at zero, right? Uh, depends on whether there is a virtual level or not, right? Whether there is some singularity at the threshold or not. So those singularities were, start, uh, were studied by Birman, Fadeev, Weinberg, E5. Uh, so somehow you see most names uh, come from St. Petersburg uh, school. 
uh, right? So then uh, th there are articles by Simon Rauch. Uh, and so this phenomenon is important in particular because uh, there is this dependence of dispersive estimates uh, satisfied by the uh, by the Laplace or by the Schrodinger equation on the presence or absence of a virtual level at the origin. So if there is a virtual level, then the dispersion is much slower, right? Uh, so there were articles to this effect on Schrodinger operator for Schrodinger operators. So this is Jensen and Carter, U5. And then recent articles by Erdogan, Schlag, Yajima. Well, not that recent. Uh, and then uh, there were also uh, articles for Dirac operators. So Busaid, Erdogan, Green. So now these are more recent articles. Uh, I should mention here that uh, all of them deal with, uh, so all these articles deal with self-adjoint operators. In fact, we will be able to uh, approach uh, also non-self-adjoint operators. So this is one of the advantages of the approach that we propose. So let's go to the next page, please. So some uh, cl classification of what we have. Uh, so for Schrodinger operators, again, self-adjoint Schrodinger operators, we know the following. In three dimensions, it is known that there is a, a virtual state at the threshold, right? Uh, So-called S state, um, in the sense that it behaves like one over R. The corresponding virtual state behaves like one over R, which is a sort of the uh, asymptotic behavior of the uh, green function of the fundamental solution at infinity. Uh, in dimensions d larger than or equal to four, there could still be one virtual state at the origin, uh, but in fact, uh, in dimension five and above, uh, this virtual state ends up being just an eigenstate. So if you have some singularity at z equals zero, then it will correspond to a true L2 eigenfunction. While in dimension three, right, uh, this virtual state is not an eigenfunction. Uh, it, it is like one over R. It behaves like one over R at infinity. Uh, now, lower dimensions are difficult. So in dimension one, you can have also at most one virtual state, uh, which is, uh, L infinity function. So if there is an L infinity solution, you call it virtual state. In dimension two, there could be, in fact, up to three virtual states. So there could be a one spherically symmetric state uh, and two states which have the form, like uh, in, um, in terminology of quantum chemistry, those are uh, P states, right? So think of X divided by R uh, square, or is it R cube? So, well, anyways, uh, so th this corresponds to the first uh, harmonic, to e to i theta. So in terms of angular variables, uh, these p states are sort of e to i theta and e to negative i theta. So these states could be at the origin, well, depending on which potential you use. If there is no potential, if you consider just the uh, Laplace operator, then it has uh, a virtual level which corresponds to a spherically symmetric state. Well, uh, the corresponding eigenfunction is just P equals one, right? So it's not an L2 function. Uh, now, uh, the question that, uh, the main question that one actually needs for many applications is that if you do not have a virtual states, then in fact, you know that your resolvent will have some nice uh, behavior in some spaces. Uh, and the problem is that uh, in dimension two, for example, uh, the only known uh, estimate is the one uh, that you see in the very last line on the slide. You see, you know that the resolvent will remain bounded if your potential is such that there is no virtual state, virtual level, uh, then the resolvent will remain bounded, but only if you sandwich it with the weights, which are the potential to one half. Of course, this is not good because your potential could be very well decaying, right? Or could be just compactly supported. In this case, uh, this, these sandwiched weights uh, seem excessive, right? So uh, they're just too strong. And we hope that, of course, for exponential decaying uh, potentials, we probably uh, have the boundedness of the resolvent just with some algebraic weights. So in, in fact, this was uh, this is exactly what 
moved us to consider uh, virtual levels and virtual states. So let's go to the next page, please. Uh, now, how to uh, characterize, how to define virtual levels? Uh, in fact, there was no strict definition. Like informal definition was that a virtual level is something that could become an eigenvalue under very small perturbation, right? So at this point, let me note that the following properties seem equivalent, right? So this equation, like P1, uh, HP equals Z0 Psi has some non-zero solution, which is from L2 or maybe from some slightly larger space, right? But not only slightly larger, not much larger space. Uh, P2 is that uh, the resolvent uh, has a limit or has no, in fact has no limit as Z approaches Z0, the point that we suspect is going to be a virtual level. So this resolvent will not have a limit uh, in some weighted spaces. And the third property is that under an arbitrarily small perturbation, an eigenvalue can bifurcate from Z0, right? You can see that all these three properties will be satisfied for negative Laplace uh, in one dimension. So just negative second derivative near the origin. Uh, so they're satisfied. And then we will say that uh, Z0 uh, is a virtual level. Right, and then you can see that P1 to P3 are not satisfied for Laplace in three dimensions uh, near the origin. So in this case, we say that Laplace in three dimensions does not have a virtual level at zero. Of course, the rigorous definition is coming, but at this moment, let, let's just notice that these properties somehow seem closely related. Uh, similar equivalence for general exterior elliptic problems was considered by Boris Feinberg back in 1975. Okay, so let's go to the next page. So uh, to sort of devise what we need, let's consider Schrodinger operators in one dimension. So here we consider this Schrodinger operator negative Laplace plus V minus Z acting on U equals zero. Well, let's say it's equal to F and we want to find the, uh, to find U from here. Uh, we will need some assumption on V. We need it to be not only from L2, uh, from L1, we also need it to be from L1 after you multiply it with X. It's common assumption in such problems. So in the case uh, when V equals zero, then as, you, uh, as we already discussed, we have the resolvent explicitly given uh, by this integral kernel, by the integral operator with this kernel that you see. Right. Uh, now, uh, when Z approaches uh, Z0, which is zero, uh, then you have a problem and you can explain why you have a problem, right? It's just because uh, your solutions, theta minus and theta plus become linearly dependent, right? Uh, your solutions are defined as, uh, as you see here, right? Uh, so these are solutions to your equation. So now we take V is zero, we take spectral parameter is zero, uh, and we require that theta minus is approximately one at negative infinity, uh, well, approaches one at negative infinity, and theta plus approaches one at positive infinity. So you see them on the picture, right? Uh, and the problem is that in, in this particular case, so spectral parameter is zero, potential is absent. It, this is the same solution, right? So this theta minus and theta plus is the same solution. So this is why when you construct your uh, green function, right? Uh, as you see uh, below on this slide, right? So g of x, y, the integral kernel, uh, is given by this uh, theta minus times theta plus taken at x and at y, right? Uh, but so you, you remember probably from the ODE theory that after you construct this uh, green function, you will divide it, you will divide this product by the wrong scan of theta plus and theta minus. And this wrong scan vanishes just because theta plus and theta minus is the same function. So this approach will not work. You will not be able to construct the green function at the origin, right? So instead, right, you know you, you, that your theta minus equals theta plus is your solutions. And you can say that they are equal to this Psi capital, uh, which will be a virtual state. You see, this is this function, which somehow corresponds to zero eigenvalue, 
but it is not from L2, it is from slightly larger space. You see, in general, when you are solving uh, this uh, Schrodinger equation in 1D, when you have compact potential, you know, uh, say spectral parameter is zero, you know that at infinity, your function is going to be linearly growing, right? So second derivative equals zero means that your function is like AX plus B, right? So in general, uh, you do not have L infinity solution. Uh, but in this case, right, when you have no potential, you do have L infinity solution, right? Uh, so somehow the guess is the following. If you have L infinity solution, uh, then you have a virtual state at zero. You have a virtual level. When you do not have L infinity solution, then there is no virtual level, right? So let's go to the next page. So it's this is exactly this dichotomy that I was telling you, right? So no virtual level at Z equals zero. It means that the uh, green function, the, fun, uh, the green function will have some limit when z approaches zero, right? And you can compute, so this is a little bit of work, you can compute that this limit will be an integral operator acting from L2 with the weight three half, so it's better than L2, uh, going to L infinity, right? Uh, and if uh, you, uh, right, and you do not have uh, L infinity, uh, solution that would qualify as virtual state, right? That would qualify as this generalized eigenfunction uh, corresponding to zero eigenvalue. Uh, now, when you have a virtual level at z zero equals zero, then the resolvent does not have a nice limit, uh, even if you consider it from c infinity with compact support to l infinity, right? Your solution will always be a uh, uh, so you, you will not have L infinity solutions. But on the other hand, right, there will be this C capital, which is just from L infinity. You will have L infinity uh, solution to this negative Laplace plus V minus zero, acting in C equals zero. Let's construct corresponding virtual state. So for this, we will do the following. I will add a perturbation W to both left-hand side and right-hand side. But I will add it so that the left-hand side will no longer have a virtual level. I will be able to compute the resolvent in the limit when Z approaches Z zero, right? Uh, and then from here, uh, you see, I can ex uh, express Psi capital as this resolvent applied to this W Psi capital. Of course, I uh, I am taking W with compact support. So uh, I'm applying resolvent to some very, very nice function. Right. So as a result, I will get this uh, PC capital, which I will call virtual state. So roughly this is what you do in one dimension. And somehow this is exactly what will happen in, high, in uh, more general situations. So let's go to the next page. So a uh, formal definition of virtual levels. Uh, so let's see. Uh, X capital is this Banach space where we consider our operator. So I will assume that I have a, a slightly smaller space, which I call E, like initial, and I have larger space F, and I have continuous embeddings E into X and then X into F, right? Uh, important point here is that we do not care that these spaces are reflexive. We do not need this assumption it's possible to drop it, uh, which is important because we want uh, to be able to deal with things such as L1, L infinity. And then the embeddings are not necessarily dense. This is also convenient in some applications. Well, by the way, uh, uh, well, it, it will come later. Okay, so let me just mention that this assumption that the embeddings are dense is somehow restrictive. It is nice that we do not need to have it. So we will assume that we have some operator, which is so closed operator uh, acting in the, in the Banach space X. And we will assume that this operator has a closable extension onto F, right? So we will say that Z0, um, well, I didn't mention one more object, sorry. So it is this omega capital. Omega capital is going to be a subset of the a resolvent set of A. So you see it is written incorrectly here as omega 
uh, is a subset of resolvent set of A. It's, it's not it's not the point, of course, it's a subset. Sorry for this type. So we say that Z0, which is uh, a point of the essential spectrum and which, uh, which is at the border of this uh, set omega, uh, is a regular point of the essential spectrum relative to this uh, triplet omega, E, and F. If there is LAP, in the sense that the resolvent has a weak limit as an operator from E to F, when Z approaches Z0, remaining in, the, in this uh, set omega. So in this case, we say that we have a regular point of the essential spectrum. It is not, uh, it is uh, maybe a slightly confusing terminology because you know that usually we call uh, regular points uh, the points which are not in the spectrum, right? Uh, but historically, just due to uh, Jensen and Kato, right, we will uh, call these regular points of the essential spectrum. It's just the uh, terminology from the article published in 1979. So if there is LAP, we say we have a regular point. Uh, now, maybe uh, we do not have a regular point. Maybe resolvent does not have a nice limit. And then we will say that Z0 is a virtual level of rank R relative, again, to this triple, triple uh, omega E and F. Uh, if it is the smallest value, smallest integer, or so, sorry, smallest natural number, as such that there is some uh, operator, some compact operator of rank R, uh, operator acting from F, large space, to E, small space, right? As such that, uh, there will be a weak limit of the regularized operator. So you take A plus B minus Z, right, inverse. And maybe this resolvent will have a limit as Z approaches Z0 rem remaining in the set omega. Uh, again, we can see that this uh, limit in the weak operator topology uh, uh, of mappings from E to F, right? So R which is the smallest possible natural number uh, such that operators of rank R allow you to regularize the, the operator so that it, its resolvent has a nice limit, right? So this R will be called the rank of a virtual level. So, okay, let's go to the next page. Uh, so this is an example that somehow I like. Uh, so we can use the same approach to uh, de define the dimension of the kernel of an operator. Uh, let me take a matrix just of size n, right? n by n matrix. And I can define the dimension of the kernel of this matrix is the minimal rank as uh, such that determine uh, minimal rank, um, uh, minimal rank of, op of, well, matrices of size n by n such that determinant of t plus b is non-zero. Right, so for example, as you see in the next line, if I take T to be this, uh, what is a Jordan block, three by three Jordan block, then I can take B of this form with just one entry, one non-zero entry, right? And then the determinant of T plus B is going to be non-zero, right? You see B has the uh, rank one, and indeed the dimension of the kernel of T is also one, right? So this is, uh, in fact, this is very closely related to the definition of that we use. Okay, so let's go to the next page. Uh, so examples. So here I will just um, recall what we already discussed. If I take Laplace uh, acting in L2 of RD, D is, uh, well, let's say at this point any uh, natural number, with domain H2. Then what we already discussed is that Z0, which is positive, so the point in the bulk of the essential spectrum is going to be a regular point of the essential spectrum of negative Laplace relative to, so here as omega, I take C plus the upper half plane, right? Uh, then I take L to S, L to negative S. Uh, so it will be a regular point as long as dimension is any, D is just any, natural number and S is larger than one half, right? So the resolvent will have a limit 
as an operator from L to S to L to negative S, uh, right? As Z approaches Z zero, which is in the bulk of the essential spectrum. So you see Z zero is positive, right? And remaining in the upper half plane. So Z belongs to C plus. This is precisely the result by Agman of uh, 1970, right? On the other hand, we know that Z zero equals zero is a regular point of the essential spectrum of negative Laplace. Again, uh, now uh, it will be relative to, uh, well, complex plane minus the spectrum. So C minus R plus a closure, right? Acting from L to S to L to negative S prime, as long as uh, D is sufficiently large. So D has to be three or larger. S and S prime have to be larger than one half. And moreover, S plus S prime is larger than two, right? So one can compute that the resolvent will have a limit in three dimensions if you consider it as an operator from L to S to L to negative S prime. So this is the usual example considered by PD people. So let's go to the next page, please. So, uh, yes, questions? No? No. Okay. Uh, so uh, this example is uh, somehow a simpler situation. So now I will just consider D over DX instead of Laplace, I consider just D over DX. Uh, so I will add the potential, subtract spectral parameter, this X on U equals F. Uh, about the potential, I will assume that it belongs to L1 uh, intersection with L infinity, right? Uh, then I, I will have, uh, that is, I consider the operator, which is D over DX plus V as an operator from L2 to L2 with the domain H1 of R, subtle space. In the case when the spectral parameter Z uh, has negative, so you, you know the essential spectrum, of course, will be just the essential spectrum of D over DX, which is the imaginary axis. So now I will be taking the spectral parameter to the left of the imaginary axis. Uh, and then, uh, of course, it is very easy to compute the uh, resolvent, right? It is just an ODE theory. You remember, you find the integrating factor, right? Uh, and then you just need to decide how to choose limits of the integration. Uh, so it's, it's just the solution of the first order ODE with variable coefficients uh, using the integrating factor. It is just this method. Uh, and then you see that the resolvent is F maps to U of X, which is integral from negative infinity to X of this expression of this integrand. Uh, and you can see, uh, so W here is just antiderivative of V. You can see that if, as long uh, as, long as uh, V satisfies this inclusion, V belongs to L1 intersection with L infinity, uh, W will be bounded, right? Uh, well, you actually W is bounded just as long as V is from L1. Uh, so uh, then you can see that this integral here uh, is a nice operator from L1 to L infinity, right? So if F belongs to L1, then U will be from L infinity. It is just because this E to Z times X minus Y, Z has negative real part, as a result, the exponent will be smaller than or equal to one, right? So integrating the product of this exponent, which is small times F, as long as F is from L1, U will be from L infinity. This is it, right? Uh, so uh, the conclusion is that any Z zero, which is from the central spectrum, which is imaginary axis, is regular relative to left a half plane, so real part of Z is negative, L1 and L infinity. That is, uh, there is a limit of the resolvent as a mapping from L1 to L infinity as Z approaches Z0. This is the lowest line on the page, right? So Z approaches Z0, which has uh, zero real part, right? Uh, and Z remains in the left half plane. So real part of Z is negative. 
right? So again, here we see that again, any uh, Z zero on the imaginary axis is a regular point of the essential spectrum, right? So let's go to the next page. Uh, now, this uh, situation is uh, maybe even more interesting because somehow we're dealing with a simpler operator. So it's just left shift uh, on N, right? So on L2 of N. Uh, and let me also mention that, well, even in the previous example, the operator was not self-adjoint. But you could say that, well, we multiply it by I, it becomes self-adjoint. Well, left shift is certainly non self adjoint in whatever meaning you want. Uh, yet we will somehow discuss its virtual levels. We will discuss the LAP principle and we will discuss virtual levels of this operator. So let's see. Uh, so LX from L2 to L2, of course, it's just left shift. X1, X2 goes to X2, X3, etc. Uh, probably you know that the spectrum of this operator is the closure of the unit disk and the complex plane. Uh, the corresponding uh, eigenfunctions could be, uh, for example, like for any lambda which is smaller than one in the absolute value, right? You can just take one lambda, lambda square, lambda cube, etc., right? Uh, and then you see that. Uh, uh, well, so, okay, let, let me skip this. Let me just not deal with this at the moment. It is easy to compute the uh, eigenvalues, eigenfunctions corresponding to any eigenvalue, any complex number in the absolute value smaller than one. So in the matrix form, L minus Z is given by this matrix that you see on the left, right? So negative Z, one, zero, 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 negative Z, one, zero, zero, et cetera. Right? And you can immediately compute the inverse of this matrix. This is the matrix on the right. It is easy to check that product is going to be the identity matrix. So here I am taking Z larger than one, right? So the resolvent set is closure of the unit disk. So for Z uh, from the, uh, uh, sorry, so the spectrum is the closure of the unit disk. The resolvent is exterior of the unit disk, right? Uh, so it is going to be uh, absolute value of Z is larger than one. And then you can see that this matrix on the right is exactly this resolvent. And then you can see that this matrix uh, is an operator from L1 to L infinity. So you can just take uh, any vector X. Uh, and as long as X is from L1, you can immediately compute uh, that uh, the result of this resolvent acting on X is going to be from L infinity, right? So just easy computation, right? So conclusion, uh, any, uh, well, uh, sorry, let me add. So it's not only that uh, this works for any Z which is larger than one in the absolute value, Right, uh, this object, this matrix on the right, also has a meaning uh, when Z approaches uh, Z0 of magnitude one, right? Uh, and this object is still an operator from L1 to L infinity. Of course, not from L2 to L2, uh, but it is going to be a nice operator from L1 to L infinity, right? So uh, the conclusion, any complex value of magnitude one is going to be a regular point of the central spectrum of the left shift. Uh, and there is a limit of the resolvent as Z remains larger than one in the absolute value. Z approaches Z zero, right? And we consider this limit uh, in term, in, um, as a mapping from L1 to L infinity. Right. Again, we have this LAP. Okay, so next page, please. So now we will construct an operator with a virtual level at zero. This will work as follows. I will pick any function from L1. So this phi is from L1, right? As K, I will take an operator, which will be of a rank one operator. Uh, so defi defined by this expression. So it acts on phi, gives me phi, right? So the simplest 
possible expression, uh, I can consider k as an operator from L infinity to L1, right? Uh, and then I will consider the following quantity, uh, the following operator, it will be A minus L, uh, sorry, A equals L minus k acting in L minus Z0. So I claim that this uh, operator has a virtual level at Z0. Right, relative to this usual triplet. So omega is the exterior of a union disk. Uh, then as the initial space, I take L1. As final space, I take L infinity, right? Uh, because a Z0 is a regular point of the essential spectrum of A plus B, right? B is defined by this K times L minus Z0. So you see A plus B is just the left shift and remember, L shift, uh, the left shift uh, has all its boundary points of the spectrum as regular points, right? So I can regularize this A, of course, just adding back this K times L minus Z0, right? Uh, and yet I can compute the corresponding virtual state. The virtual state will be uh, this resolvent L minus Z0 identity inverse acting on phi. So you can see that A minus Z0 acting on Psi capital, right? So you see this is the slowest line. A minus Z0 acting on Psi capital. Uh, A is this L minus K times L minus Z0, right? Uh, minus all of this minus Z0. Uh, so you can just regroup your quantities. L minus Z0 acting on this L minus Z0 inverse is identity, which you see on the very right of this last line, right? And then you have K times L minus Z0 times L minus Z0 inverse. So it all multiplies to K. So it's identity minus K acting in phi gives you zero, right? So, okay, we were able to find this L infinity solution, right? Uh, corresponding to uh, virtual level Z0. So this is the way to construct virtual levels for, for an operator. We started from an operator which has no virtual levels, all uh, points of this, uh, all boundary points of the essential spectrum are regular points, right? And now we just uh, use this combination to construct an operator which has a virtual level. Again, an important point is that now we're dealing with an example of a virtual level of non self adjoint operators. In fact, the operator is also very nice, right? So it's bounded. Uh, yeah, so yeah, so it's better than usual Schrodinger operators, something more convenient. So let's go to the next page. Uh, another example. So I told you that a point of the essential spectrum could be a, what it could be a regular point of the essential spectrum, or it could be a virtual level when we need to regularize our operator before we can compute the limit of the resolvent. In fact, it could be neither, right? So zero, just a simple example is a zero operator. For a zero operator, the spectrum consists of only one point of the origin of zero, right? Essential spectrum equals zero uh, because uh, the corresponding eigen uh, space is of infinite dimension, right? So I, of course, uh, I assume that X is infinite dimensional Banach space. So uh, now I will pick any state, any spaces E and F so that I have these dense embeddings E into X into F. Again, I will assume the dimension of E is infinity. And as my regularizing operator, I'll take any operator of finite rank. So B0, 0, zero fi means finite rank uh, from F to E. And then I will consider projection on the kernel of this uh, operator B, right? It is given by this P0. Uh, integral of the resolvent over this uh, small circle around the origin. As the radius of the circle, uh, I will take a number, a positive number, which is smaller than the smallest non-zero eigenvalue of B, right? So remember, B is finite train operator, so it will have, uh, well, this is not nice, right? So here, of course, uh, I can see the B as an operator from X to X, right? So initially I start is, uh, with an operator from F to E, so I will consider its restriction onto X, 
right? So then there will be the smallest eigenvalue, smallest non-zero eigenvalue. And as epsilon, I will take a number smaller than this smallest non-zero eigenvalue. Uh, yes, so this gives me projection onto the kernel. And then this combination, you see n plus b minus z inverse acting on p0. I can compute it explicitly, immediately. Well, b restricted on the range of p0 gives me 0, n was 0 operator. So uh, as a matter of fact, I deal just with this z inverse acting times p0 as an operator from E to F. And this is always unbounded, right? So when Z approaches zero, uh, this combination will never have a limit, right? So it cannot be bounded uniformly in Z. So as a result, Z zero, which is zero, is neither a regular point nor a virtual level relative to, uh, well, exterior of the spectrum, right? So C minus zero and any spaces E and F. So in fact, zero operator is not nice at all, right? So uh, the spectrum is not a virtual level. So let's go to the next page. Let me just check how we deal with the time. Yeah, okay. Uh, so uh, space of virtual states. Uh, the definition is suggested, but what we have seen before. So I will, as a space of virtual states, uh, say, uh, I have a point Z0, which is a virtual level of rank R relative to some uh, subset of a resolvent set, so which I call omega, right? And then I will define the space of virtual states as the range of the regularized resolvent. So you, as a B, as B, you take any finite rank operator from F to E, such that the limit exists, the limit of the resolvent at the point Z0 exists. Right, is an operator from E to F, right? So if this uh, limit exists, then uh, just the range of this operator will be, uh, oh, I, I, so sorry, so you take all the states from this range, which satisfy the equation A minus Z zero acting on Psi capital equals zero, of course. So there's a, a sort of generalized eigen states Right, so they are not necessarily from L2, but you require that they are from the range of the regularized result. And then uh, you can prove the following theorem. This uh, regular, uh, this space of virtual states, it will not depend on the choice of your regularizing operator B, right? Uh, it, uh, it, is all, um, it contains the, uh, the uh, well, eigenstate, uh, sorry, eigenspace corresponding to Z0. Well, not exact. It will contain the uh, kernel of A minus Z0, but you need to take the intersection with the space E. The space E could be too small, and then, I mean, it could happen that uh, the kernel will not be a subspace of M, uh, so you need to take this intersection. E intersection with the kernel of, with the eigenspace, then will be the subspace of all your virtual states. And then you can prove that actually the dimension of your space of virtual states is exactly R, which came as a, uh, let me remind you, it was the minimal rank of the regularizing operator. So uh, in the case when this uh, space of virtual states is not a subspace of X, right? It could be just a subspace of X. So then you are dealing with uh, just eigenstates, right? So if it is a not subspace of X, then you say that the zero is a genuine virtual level. So there are some states which are not sort of, not L2 states, right? Uh, and elements uh, from this M minus X will be called virtual states. So this is a, reg uh, this is a rigorous definition of a virtual state. So let's go to the next page, please. Uh, so, uh, important question is whether there is dependence or whether there is no dependence on the regularizing uh, spaces E and F. Right. Uh, so, it turns out that in, in, sometimes there is dependence, sometimes there is no dependence. Uh, if you choose different regular uh, spaces E and F, so say E1 and E2, F1 and F2. So in case when 
E1 intersection with E2 is dense in both E1 and E2. And F1 and F2 are dense in F1 plus F2. And moreover, you require that F1 plus F2 star is dense in F1 star and F2 star, right? Uh, in this case, uh, well, you also need to assume that this zero is a virtual level with respect to both E1 to F1 and E2 to F2, F2. And then it turns out that the rank, this R1 and R2 will be the same. So the rank uh, with respect to these different spaces, E1, F1 and E2, F2 will be the same. And moreover, the space of virtual states will also be the same. So in this case, in this sense, uh, there is no dependence on the regularizing spaces E and F, right? Uh, and now, uh, on the other hand, right, if you do not assume that these spaces E1 and E2 are mutually dense and F1 and F2 are mutually dense, then again, let's go to the next page. Then there could be a trouble. So this is this example due to Roma, Roman Romanov that we uh, that I know. So as you remember, Laplace in one dimension has no limit as an operator from L to S to L to negative S, right? When Z approaches zero. Uh, but you can show that if you if, if as the space E you will take a different space. So you see uh, you're taking L2, uh, L2S functions. You see this is the definition of the space E. But you also require that the Fourier transform of these functions vanishes at the origin of sufficiently high order, right? Uh, of order at least, uh, actually of order more than one. So you see this tau that you see here, right? Is the order of vanishing. So you require that this order is larger than one. You can introduce the metric in this space, so it will be a nice Banach space. So you see it's L2S norm uh, plus this supremum of U hat of C divided by C to the power tau, right? It will be a nice Banach space. And then you can show that in fact, zero is going to be regular relative to, uh, relative, well, as an, if you consider your resolvent as, as a mapping from E to L2 negative S prime, yeah. right? But in this case, E and L2S are not mutually dense, although both spaces are nicely dense in L2. So you see, uh, it is in, important which spaces you take. Of course, in, for applications to PD operators, you always know which spaces you want and uh, spaces are going to be mutually dense. So let's go to the next page. Maybe we will have to skip it. So this is just very, you don't need to read the theorem. Uh, you just need the, uh, what is it? The third line from the line before the theorem, right? So uh, if there is a bifurcate, if there is a family of eigenvalues that bifurcates from Z zero or from this point of the essential spectrum, then you know that you have a virtual level of rank at least one. And on the contrary, if you have, if you know that your Z zero is a virtual level of rank at least one, then you can produce any family of eigenvalues that bifurcates from Z zero. So it's just, you know, back and forth, right? If, if there is a family of bifurcations, then you know that you're dealing with the virtual level and vice versa. And this is just this uh, analytical way to express all of that. So let's go to the next page. Uh, so Fred Holm alternative, right? So if you want to solve the equation, uh, sorry, I think I will be going out of time at this point. So uh, let me just mention that you can, uh, in this case, the Fred Holm alternative takes the following form. If uh, you have this A minus Z zero acting on U equals phi, then as long as phi is orthogonal uh, to the virtual states of the adjoint operator, then there is a solution. Only in this case, there will be a solution. And the solution will be unique if you require that the solution is somehow orthogonal uh, to the space of virtual states. Well, so anyways, the program alternative makes just takes the usual form, but now you are dealing with these regularizing spaces E and F as opposed to X. And the, finally, the next page. So this is the let's go to the next page. 
So this is for joint operators. Uh, so uh, for simplicity, let me assume that both E and F are reflexive. In this case, uh, the point Z0 is a virtual level of rank R of your operator A, if and only if uh, Z0 bar is a virtual level of rank R of operator A star of the joint operator. You can do slightly better in case you do not assume that the spaces are reflexive. So then there is this virtual level of the of your operator is smaller than or equal to virtual rank of a virtual level of the joint operator. Uh, and finally, let's keep let's go to the next page. So this is applications to Schrodinger operators. Uh, so essentially, I already told you what it is. So we we can do any we can deal with any non self adjoint operators in any dimension. Let's go to the next page. Yes. Yeah, so this is this theorem, which is confusing uh, because it gives you all dimensions. Let's go to the next one where we only deal with dimension two, which is important. So in two dimensions, so the result was not known, right? So here we're saying that z zero is zero. So th there are two possibilities. Either Z0 is a virtual level of your Schrodinger operator in two dimensions, right? So if this point is regular, then the resolvent has a nice limit as an operator from L to S to L to negative S with S larger than two, uh, larger than one, sorry. In fact, you can improve this. You can show that the resolvent uh, will be a bounded operator from L1 to L2 negative S and also from L to S to L infinity. So these estimates were just not known, right? Or alternatively, your, or the, the origin is not a regular point. In this case, it is a virtual level, right? And then there is a state which belongs to L infinity and which solves the equation negative Laplace plus V uh, acting on Psi equals zero. So it's either regularity of the resolvent in these spaces that you see here, or you have a virtual state which is all infinity. So uh, let me stop at this point. Thank you very much.